we we don't have good systems for helping people know how to live and live fully and thrive and access what is necessary for a thriving existence as opposed to just survival. Most people are just surviving and that's not satisfying. Hey there, my name is Sean and this is Suicide Noted. On this podcast, I talk with suicide attempt survivors so that we can hear their stories. Every year around the world, millions of people try to take their own lives and we almost never talk about it. And when we do talk about it, many of us, including me, aren't very good at it. So one of my goals with this podcast is to have more conversations and hopefully better conversations with attempt survivors. I'm going to keep trying. Now we're talking about suicide, so this may not be a good fit for everybody. Please take that into account before you listen. But I do hope you listen because there is so much to learn. If you are a suicide attempt survivor and you'd like to share your story, I'd love to talk. Please reach out. Hello at SuicideNoted.com or on Facebook or Twitter at Suicide Noted. And help us out. If you listen on Apple Podcasts, please rate, review, and or subscribe. It really does help people find this podcast. And I really do believe there are a lot of people that could benefit from hearing this podcast. So let's help them find it, please. Thanks for that. Today, I am talking with Lara. Lara lives in Ontario, Canada, and she is a suicide attempt survivor. Hey, Lara. So let's jump right in. Most people who uh, go through this stuff, they don't really talk so openly about it. So I'm always really grateful for people that are willing to do that. Yeah, same. I mean, me too. I, uh, it's kind of part of my MO, that willingness to have the conversations that other people don't want to have because we need to have them. And yeah. often it doesn't happen. It doesn't get discussed until it's too late. So, Right. Question. This, is, this isn't really about you, but I'm wondering, do you have any thoughts or ideas as to why it is that we seem to not want to have these conversations? Oh, it's interesting. Uh, a friend, we were strangers prior to a, a few months ago, we met on Clubhouse uh-huh. in a completely unrelated room topic. Somehow I mentioned that I had lost my sister to suicide and she lost her brother to suicide. And so we connected and started a room on Clubhouse specifically to talk about suicide in that instance, from the point of view of being survivors of suicide loss. So right. I am both a survivor of my own attempt and a survivor of suicide loss, actually multiple times over because I lost, I have lost friends as well. But in, mm. in this context, the most prescient one was the loss of my sister a few years ago. And so we've been exploring that idea and asking those very questions. One of her comments, her name is Pamela was that, you know, if the system that exists, the mental health system that currently exists was working, then it would be working, but it's not working. Like millions of dollars go into it every year and suicide rates go up, not down. So it's evident that what we're doing is not working. I mean, it may work for some people, but it's not working on a, on a sort of a mass scale, you know, and then another comment from another person who joined the room. So he joined from the UK for him, it was, it's the middle of the night when we start mm-hmm. and we had suicide right in the title. And he said, you know, I only came tonight because it's late and there's a less likely chance of other people on the app who know me, seeing me mm-hmm. hanging around in this room. And I think it has a whole range of reasons, but there's professionalism. And if you're a professional and you have a certain reputation, not wanting people to know that you're thinking that way. Um, my experience of trying to get help through typical mental health channels was that I just kept getting turned away and being told I was dramatic, like family all too, you're drama queen, you over exaggerate everything, you just want attention, like all of that kind of stuff. So I think part of the reason is because people recognize that it's just futile. Like they try, they try to get help. They try to get people to listen. Mm -hmm. And the world is just kind of like, yeah, whatever, I'm too busy, or you're being dramatic, or I don't have time for this, or you're fine, you know, go take a happy pill or have a drink with a friend and everything will be okay. And then after the fact, 
those same people like, oh my God, if only we'd known. And if there's only, you know, if only they told us and whatever. And right. meanwhile, right. like the right. person they told you. is screaming all the way through going, I'm fucking yeah, trying yeah. to tell you. Oh you know? yeah, 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 100%. So it's a layered issue. There's a lot of nuance. There's individual pe- peculiarities and particularities mm. that, that make one person unwilling to speak for a different reason than another but i think yeah. those are some of the contributing factors people yeah, yeah. say they'll be there but the reality is most of the time they're not and and i think that that's not even because people don't care i think our whole entire culture places value on the wrong things mm-hmm. and everyone is just exhausted you know mm-hmm. like trying to do their own life so the bandwidth mm-hmm. for it for that level of support for other people is pretty narrow yeah. I, think. I agree with everything you're saying yeah. yeah yeah and there does seem to be more spaces whether it's clubhouse or facebook or elsewhere for uh survivors of loss which is a great thing right mm-hmm. presumably those those groups are helpful i don't i don't know all of them of course there's far fewer, in my experience, from what I found out, for uh, attempt survivors. Interesting. Uh, so I, d- I perceived it the other way. But you're right. Yeah, like like it's normal for, you know, for example, there's a chapter in San Diego where Pamela lives. It's literally called Survivors of Suicide Law yes. in San Diego. So I'm, and maybe it's different in the States than in Canada. But, but you're right. And I think that's because, maybe because then it's after the fact. So it's like, okay, this thing happened. So now we're dealing with grief, which is a more sort of, yeah, I think it's easier to package in a way. Grief is easy, even though it's not. Like grief is a beast unto itself. Like dealing with the aftermath and someone who is grieving, I think is marginally easier than dealing with someone who is in that process of suicide ideation. You know, in part, there's the fear that you'll say something that's the wrong thing that will trigger someone to act and you don't want that weight of that responsibility Again, there's a whole bunch of reasons. And we've had some interesting discussions in this clubhouse room, openly talking about the topic in a way that I think is atypical. You know, like Mm -hmm. for him, it seems like a logical choice. (laughs) And I'm not trying to talk him out of that. I'm like, I've said to him, you know, I hope that you don't follow through and it would not be my desire. And I'm not condoning or suggesting anything one way or another, but I'm listening to you and I understand and respect your point of view. Most of the time, there's this talk about suicide prevention and trying to trying to talk a person out of it and telling them all the things they need to do to feel better instead of maybe holding space for all the reasons they actually feel shitty. That's the only reason I have a podcast. Yeah. That's really it. I mean, in that process of holding space as best I can, other stuff comes out that hopefully is beneficial for both the person who's sharing it and people that hear it. That really, you boiled it down, and that's 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 really what it is. I also think, and I just wonder, you know, if somebody loses somebody, massive empathy to them, right? The loss no. of somebody that way. Uh, so we want to have support for them. But if you try, I think there's. I mean, these. This is just me speaking, not you, obviously, but. there's a little bit of a fuck you oh yeah there's lots of like shame on you and how and all this kind of stuff and you know pamela that i keep referring to her this girl that i was co-hosting this room with a close friend of hers husband died by suicide in 2017 very famous human being so the world knows of this suicide and knows of the persona of this person and therefore there's lots of commentary about well he had everything so how could he and whatever like how dare he and again i think it goes back to those societal structures and these societal ideas of like well, you've got wealth and you've got fame. So you've got all the things I'm chasing. So how dare you kill yourself? Because now you're telling me that the thing that I'm chasing after in order to feel happy for myself isn't going to make me happy when I get there. And I don't want to face that reality. Maybe so, yeah. So the anniversary of my attempt just passed. It was June 27th, 24 years ago. Uh, I remember the day vividly, you know, as if it were yesterday. But it was interesting. I was contemplating it differently this year. I don't know if we're friends on Facebook, but I did a project in February. I did a friendship project. I don't have a lover or a partner or a husband or whatever. So Valentine's Day can can often be one of those subjects where you're like, "Mm, 
oh, here yeah, we go, yeah. you know, 15 years running, you know, I'm like celebrating this on my own. And so I sort of copycatted an idea that a friend of mine has where rather than celebrating romantic love, she celebrates the love of friendship. And so for the entire month of February, once a day for 28 days, I posted a lengthy post about a friend of mine and described them in detail and describe what I love about them, what makes them lovable and what I cherish about having that love in my life. And it was, uh, it was really quite something because you know that you love your friends, but you don't always really sit down and think through why, what is it about them and yeah. how do they add value to your life? And so on the 14th, which is Valentine's day, I chose to highlight my best friend in life myself. And I wrote about myself in third person as though I were writing about any other one of my friends and described the things that I value and that I appreciate and that I love and ways that I add value to my own life. And it really struck me after the fact when I thought, my God, I tried to kill her. Wow. You know, and I'd never thought of it from that point of view before. Obviously, that's not a thing you would ever do to your best friend. You wouldn't even necessarily contemplate doing it to yeah. your best friend. Maybe yeah. a sibling or something when you're having a really, you know, particularly rivalrous moment. But uh, so that was an interesting spin for me. And, it, and I didn't feel guilt exactly, more so shock that I could, that I could have contemplated causing such a person such harm. But to go back to your point, you know, there, there's a lot of anger from people, I find, about that. Lots of accusations about selfishness and wanting attention. And again, I remember after, in the aftermath, like in my recovery, a couple of people saying, well, you just wanted attention. You were just trying to get attention. And I said, first of all, that's not accurate. Like, I was committed. I wanted it to work. I'm glad that it didn't. But at the time, it's what I wanted. But secondly... Even if all I wanted was attention, what is wrong with me wanting enough right. attention right. for me to feel like I value, I have value, you know? 100%, yes. Yeah. So, so I'm like, so I kind of want to look at those people and go, and what's your argument? Like, what's your point? When people say that to me, I always wonder, well, are you giving this person in your life any attention? Right, exactly. You need attention, dude. Like, if you're ignoring people that you can Maybe that is a not a good thing. I don't know. And direct contradiction to all these messages of like Bell Let's Talk Day and the, the suicide house and all the time, all the messages from every direction you see, you know, if you're having a hard time, reach out. And it's like, but you don't get it. The person that's having the hard time can barely get out of bed. Never mind. Feel as though they have the right to impose that much pain of their own upon other people. Yeah. It's yeah. such a catch 22. Yes. It's, it's a difficult position to Look, while I would always encourage anybody to reach out to a hotline if they're struggling and they're having those kinds of thoughts, let's be, let's be very real here. It's very limiting. For a couple of years, I was uh, a crisis text line counselor. 741, 741, text it from certain, some countries. I was one of the many people on the other end. And it, it can help. It can get you maybe through a particularly difficult moment. It might be able to give you a resource perhaps that you didn't know about, though Google is a pretty powerful search engine. But that's about it. And not to suggest that that's not a big thing, but it is only what it is. Here's the thing. My first thought upon waking up in the hospital that day, so it was Wellesley Central Hospital in Toronto. That hospital is no longer there, but they really built a new one in the corner. And every time I drive by that corner, I have this memory of like, that's where they saved my life. But I can still visualize the moment in the emergency room. And yeah, so I was coming back to your point about the, the hotline. You know, the hotline might get you through that one minute. But my very first thought upon waking on the table, so I had, you know, charcoal vomit all over myself. I had had my stomach pumped. 90 pills, I think, and half a bottle of vodka and uh, my wrist stitched. I woke up and my family was there much to my surprise. Like they, it was the middle of the night. So my mother had left a nursing shift. My sister had, my mother, and my sister two came from three hours away. And then my other sister and her husband were here in the city and seeing the looks on their faces was the moment that I recognized that perhaps I had been wrong, that maybe I wasn't as disposable as I believed myself to be. But the first thought was, not only do I not want to die, I want to live. 
Mm -hmm. And that's different than just existing. Mm -hmm. And I think this thing that you're referring to, so the helpline and that sort of thing. So it can get someone through a moment of crisis, but Mm -hmm. then what? Correct. It's not enough to just exist. It's not enough to just have a pulse. You, we, we don't have good systems for helping people know how to live and live fully and thrive and access what is um, necessary for a thriving existence as opposed yeah. to just survival. Most people are just surviving and that's not satisfying. And so no. I think that people who have are suicidal end up in this vicious cycle. It's like I live through the day, but I'm actually more fucking miserable because nothing's different. Great. I'm still alive, but now what? Absolutely. Yeah. And I just, I feel like, you know, to Pamela's point, if the system worked, it would be working. There's millions of dollars that go into mental health, but it's clearly not addressing the source issues. People are over medicated, under supported, you know, COVID did a beautiful job of pointing out where health vulnerability and poverty intersect. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in Toronto, at least our biggest hotspots were the spots where people were most impoverished and most at risk or least access to health and health supports and community supports. And it's like, there's more to this. It should be, the focus should be on wellness and the, and the, there are pillars to wellness that I think the vast majority of the systems that we live within right now completely ignore. They just bypass it. Well, yeah. There's one thing that I, comes up sometimes in, in this podcast, and it comes up other times too in the story stuff, in the story world, for me anyway, that almost everybody could do and they just don't want to. And they're, you, we're not talking about mental health practitioners, though they're included in this. Really, truly, if you understood the power, not you per se, but others truly understood the power of listening well, I don't care what adverb you want to put in front of that, uh, the adverb of the day, it's radical listening or active listening, fine. Just fucking listen. Right. Legit, legit. Stop bullshitting us. Right. Legit listen. I have no numbers and I cannot prove this. I can promise some, I can, I know for sure the suicide rate goes down. Yeah. 100%, I would bet my life on it. Yeah, it would go down, and I don't know if it would be drastic, but it would be. And you could do that. You, you, you can't. I don't think you, Lara, can prescribe medicine, nope. and I don't think you're qualified. I'm not sure. You'll tell me if I'm wrong. To give professional counseling, uh, you can listen, right? And, and anyone, anyone. Can. I mean, has the 90- technical has the technical ability. Maybe they, maybe not the skill set in particular, they, but it's I but mean, it's something that's available to learn for each one of us has the capacity to learn. Yes. It, or I would think the majority of us anyway. That's what motivated Pamela and I to start talking about it because we're like, we know, we know that this is what it takes. I don't have to fix you. I don't have to tell you what to do. I don't have to prescribe anything to. It can be enough to just listen. Just pay attention. uh, You know, one of the rules within the context of that conversation is don't come in here and give people unsolicited advice. People know what they need. Yeah, maybe like a 12-year-old doesn't. There's exceptions, right? Someone's having some sort of major break from reality. Yeah, there's certain steps you need to do and listening might be... Yeah, yeah, look, sometimes you just got to take some 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 corrective action, I guess. But 99% for most humans, most of the time, you're right. I, I know the options for me for a doctor and the medication and the well, walking. And I, and even, I know, you know, I don't even think it's that so much as like knowing that what I need is for someone to hear me. What yeah. I need is to be seen. What yeah. I need is to be accepted as I am in this moment. You know, for example, it took me years to recognize that I, w- I was continuously going back to the wrong well for some of my needs to get met. So there's particular mm-hmm. people in my family who are not the people that are going to give me the emotional support that I need for whatever reason. Either they're not interested or they don't have the toolkit of their own. But yeah. because they were family and because they were specific types of family relationships, I believed they were the source. Right. Over and over and over, I would go back over and over and over, I would be disappointed, heartbroken, dejected, uh, feel abandoned, etc. So it's it's this never ending negative cycle until I finally recognized, wait a sec, that's not the person from whom to get that need met. Mm-hmm. So so knowing what you need and knowing how to get it are not equal. But the vast majority of people 
I think, have a pretty good sense of what it is that's missing from them and that's causing the pain. And so, but what to do about it can often be the mystery. So we self-medicate, we drink, we take drugs, we, you know, we have reckless sex, we do whatever, scroll the internet all day long because we can't satisfy that need. And oftentimes I think people go to the wrong human sources in their lives. And so I think where the gap is, is helping, helping people learn even that particular thing, that's the wrong well, but it doesn't mean you can't have it at all. It just means you can't get it from that source. So here's where the opportunity for help lies. Let's show you how to get the tools so that you can untangle your emotional connection, you know, to that person and figure out, oh, it's okay if it comes from a different place. Now, where is that place? Can I create community and supports for myself? And then, so I think the how is in there, but even still, it's very dangerous to be prescriptive. It's more like you say, like listening to hear what it is that the person is missing and then asking permission to help. You know, I have a perspective on that. Would it be okay 100%. if I shared it? You nailed right? it. Yep, yep, yep. When I when it comes up for me, and it doesn't happen often when someone reaches out, hey, I know you've got this podcast and I'm my friend's going through something. I'm like, look, I'm not probably not the best guy here, but if you want my thoughts, mostly you need to just not talk. Uh, you need to listen. And here's what that might look like. And and you just you just nailed it. It's and you can always simply ask permission. Let's just say you have this burning desire. You just know this thing's gonna help them, whether it's true or not. Just ask them if they want to hear that right now. They can say yes or no. Yeah. And then if they say no, shelve it for a little while. Maybe right. you'll come back to it another time. So simple in my mind. Just I ask agree. them. And, and I think the critical piece there is honoring that no. Like yeah. no, no means no. It's a rule in my house. It's a rule with my kid. It doesn't matter if you understand the reason why someone said no. No means no, period. Full stop. Because yeah, it's yeah. the only yeah. way you're going to establish trust. And then because you honor the no, there's a strong likelihood that when that person does want to know, and is how ready for the rest of the conversation, they'll come back and ask for how it. How many of you? Because guess yeah. what? You're a very rare company that does that for them. Exactly. But guess who they're coming to? They're coming to the person they can trust. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, there's honoring the other person's timeline within that as well, right? It's like, of course, if so, if you hear fear that someone is suicidal and you're freaking out and like, oh my God, I have to fix this whole situation right now. It's like, that's not very likely. You're just going to put more pressure on them. Right, um, right, right, right. Like, 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 like. <laughs> Like you're going to fix this thing, this massive thing in their life. Come on, relax. Like take a breath. You're you're not going to fix it right now, probably. Yeah. And the other tricky part here is, and these are, I'm sort of opening up these big, big conversations is look, if you want to try to squeeze it into a tweet, it's probably not going to work. You're going to have to maybe take a little more time than nine seconds, sit your ass down and give them a little time. Yeah. Well, I mean, have you ever had a conversation? I'm, I frankly am not the greatest at this, but have you ever had a conversation with someone? I mean, I'm not the greatest at being that active listener person. It, in certain contexts, I'm really great at it, but but in sort of everyday life, I'm I'm really not. Yeah, I sure. work on it. But um, have you ever had a conversation where you say nothing? You say almost nothing. You just kind of sit there and let a person just say all the things they want to say. And then afterwards they're like, wow, that was a really great discussion or you're really helpful or whatever. And it's like, I didn't actually do anything. Like they did it themselves. And I really think your point is so important. It's, it's that we don't get listened to people listen for their chance to talk. We live in a world now in particular that's all about being performative. So look at me and look how great my life is and look how smart I am and look how much advice I can give to you about how to be a great person. But there's very little shutting up. What I, I always say this and people like kind of like laugh, I think a little bit at them, like mostly what you need to do is stop talking. It's not enough usually on its own, just that, but start there. Wait, mm-hmm. you're still talking. Stop talking. Yeah. Stop talking. You can't do both. Step one, stop talking, and then we'll worry about, or we can concern ourselves with active whatever. Right, right. Stop talking. Yeah. I mean, that's something physical that people can measure. Active right. listening, hard to measure. Are you talking? Okay, you're not doing it. Stop. You're, oh, wait, you're still talking. I get into this little like role play because I'm like, no, wait, you're just, you're, you're still talking. <laughs> it's really hard for people though, right? I mean, again, yes. it's, 
It's a communication skill. It's it's being willing to hold awkwardness. It's like you don't have to fill up the space with sound just because it's empty. It's okay. We're never taught these things. I, I, I talk about this all the time, how right. we go to school to learn to become employees, but we don't go, we don't learn, you know, basic critical thinking skills and effective communication and relationship skills. And the crazy thing about that is no matter what job we're doing to make money, 100% of the time we're in relationship with other people and we really right. suck at being with it's, one another. It's weird that we, we emphasize it so little in most schools. Maybe there's a Quaker school somewhere that does that shit. I don't know. Most public schools, most schools, they don't have the time or they don't, they don't, they, this is not on their agenda. It's not um, the learning model, right? I mean, right. Meisner, Meisner does that. Gestalt does that, but the, but the education system was literally invented to create employees. It's yeah. people for a workforce. It's not about. And so I think there's a major flaw there. And then, you know, people will say, I had this discussion on the weekend. People will say it was up to the parents to teach that. And I was like, well, how the hell are the parents supposed to teach it if no one taught them? It, the skill set needs to be yeah. taught en masse and then passed on. And I, I mean, I'm thinking as I'm listening about what's going on in Canada right now with all the, um, you know, with the indigenous community and finally the truth being literally unearthed. Literally. And the suicide rates in the indigenous communities are through the roof. And I'm like, right, because why? Because nobody was listening because they were screaming it for 150 years and no one was listening. And, and a lot of what's going to help right now and a lot of what we're seeing happening and indigenous people are saying, it's like, stop talking, stop. listen to us. Stop talking. Are you comfortable sharing more about your attempt? What led up to it? Sure. Uh, again, however you want to, if you've heard the podcast, you know, I, I get pretty granular, but I never want somebody to say anything that they're not comfortable talking about. But I think there are people that need to hear it. I really do. Um, you did share some, uh, this was what, 97, if I did mm -hmm. my math? Yep. When I say led up to it, it could be when you were six years old or it could have been the night before, however you sort of want to frame it. Yeah, well, it's sort of, I mean, it's all of the above. So, uh, yeah. so in my, uh, I grew up in a house with an extraordinarily violent father. So- you think of the shining <laughs> it's kind of like that you know there was there's a memory uh well there's a memory that actually had turned itself into a recurring nightmare until in 2016 when i did my first live storytelling event and a friend shared a memory of a shared experience at my house and described this dream in detail because she was there for the night that it happened so i had not no knowledge of it being real until that night in 2016 but wow an example um, that my father, I, I can't remember what it was that made him angry, but he, we were six and seven, six or seven years old ish mm -hmm. chased and lived in this huge old horrible haunted. Well, not, it was beautiful, but a huge haunted house mansion right. mm -hmm. chasing us around the house with a loaded handgun screaming. It, yeah. We locked ourselves in the bathroom to get away from him and pounding on the door on the other side of the door. So very Jack Nicholson in the shining kind of vibes. Uh, come out of there or I'll burn the motherfucking house down with you in it kind of stuff. And we were little enough that we were trying to figure out if we could fit down the laundry chute in order to escape him, which would have seen us falling three floors to the basement, actually probably getting stuck and dying in there. But that was his behavior. That was one example of many violent, violent rages and loaded mm -hmm. guns and animals being kicked. And I mean, he was also funny and gregarious and larger than life. And one of those people that filled a room and, you know, in spite of yourself, you liked him, but he was terrifying. So that's my childhood. He went to prison a week before I turned 10. And it's interesting now when I think about the suicide attempt was just before my birthday. And each year on my birthday, I always get a little bit kind of melancholy and weird. And I had never put those things together until just a few years ago, I was like, oh my God, it was a week before this milestone birthday. I must somehow emotionally associate my birthday with trauma because mm -hmm. I tend mm -hmm. to like, you know, avoid it a little bit. Mm. So that happened. He went to prison. We lived in a very small town. He went to prison for sexual abusing my sisters and others. All of that story sort of got revealed after the fact. And, um, I'm being a little bit clinical about this. I'm sorry. It's, it's, I get yeah. a bit removed from it when I'm telling it, but in yeah. a town of 5,000 people where we had lived all of our lives, the story made the newspaper. Of course, the shame is ours to bear, not his, because now he's gone. 
Mm. He's in jail. He only went to prison for 15 months, despite the abuses having lasted for years and years. So I'm the only person in my family who's really um, emotionally expressive. The rest of them sort of stuff it. And so, as I said, I was 10. There was no explanation. They felt I was too young. And so there was tantrums and there was anger. And then the more that I reacted that way, the more I was told I was being selfish. And the only person I cared about was myself. So there was just no dealing with the trauma and the impact and the aftermath, none whatsoever. We had no counseling. Mm. There was no conversation. I was just supposed to suck it up and deal with it. And I had witnessed some pretty awful graphic things as well. Like that wasn't something that he had intended, but it had happened a few times. So I got wild. You know, I started drinking when I was 14, probably partying is small town. So it was a pretty normal part of the culture, but, um, I developed a reputation. I was for being a slut, I guess, seeking out love wherever I could get it. So I was bullied quite badly. That's when the bullying began. And I was raped at a party by two, two guys at once, both of whom had previously been friends and they got away with that. I tried to tell someone at school the next day and it just resulted in more shame and more bullying it came back on me. So the whole the whole normal scenario of victim blaming and you deserved it and you brought it on yourself and all of that kind of stuff. And I really believed that at that point, because, of course, now it's years into the shame around our family events and bullying in high school and reckless behavior and not having any self-confidence or feeling of worth whatsoever. My mom worked 12 hour shifts as a nurse and she just never knew where I was. Like no one ever really checked to make sure that I was okay. And of course, in any act of rebellion, the reaction was you're bad. You're a bad person. Like you're doing this because you're selfish rather than, you know, ever anyone ever saying what's wrong. Can Mm. we help? You Mm. know? And so over time, I really developed this belief that there just wasn't anyone that was going to help and there wasn't anyone that cared. And my motto kind of at the time, like I got really toughened up on the outside and, you know, I'll fuck you before you fuck me. So I'll make sure that I sabotage this or I fuck you over before you have the chance to hurt me. And I really that shell sort of just got thicker and thicker. And then by the time I was 19, I had moved out. I guess I was 18 when I moved out and I you know, again, small town. So there's drugs everywhere. So then the drugs, I started using cocaine and got, you know, it's just more and more It's very textbook projection, like trajectory, I should say. And so by my mid twenties, I ended up in a relationship with a guy who was not so different from my dad, sociopathic, very charming, gregarious, lots of money, you know, the lifestyle and the whole thing, quite a lot older than me, nine years or so. And I think it was probably a repeat of that childhood relationship. And it was just volatile and really fucked up. And we were doing like 72 hour Coke binges with 10 bottles of wine over that time. And and so it was just like absolute self-destruction at that point. And I kept saying to him, like, the come downs are too hard. I, I'm finding it harder and harder to recover. We have to stop. And and he wouldn't. He was married too, of course. So he was emotionally unavailable, of course, because that's another part of the puzzle, right? And there was this one night, that night in June, he had come to this Toronto um, for his cousin's wedding. And he was supposed to come over to my place first. And I sat waiting, staring out the window, waiting for him to come. And by this point, my family, I had quite, I'd ostracized them because I was really acting out. I'd lost my job because I was supposed to go to rehab and then I didn't go. So EAP fell through and, you know, it was pretty catastrophic. And I had, I didn't steal money or do things like that, but I had taken advantage of people a a bit. You know, I wasn't, (laughs) I wasn't my, my best self at that point. And so my family didn't have much use for me really by then. They were pretty frustrated And so he was kind of my world. And so here I am waiting for him to come and waiting for him to come. And he didn't show up. And I just, I think I just sort of had this awareness. I remember sitting with my nose pressed on the window and thinking, he's not going to come. And I can't do this anymore. Like, I just can't bear the weight anymore of the shame and the loss of everything that had been taken And that people say you love you, they love you, but they don't, Mm -hmm. they don't, they don't, they leave, you know, 
people say you, they love you, but they leave. And I, and I was just devastatingly lonely. And I, and the, it was the weight though. It was the crushing weight of loneliness, abandonment, betrayal, and shame. And I'm like, I'm just so tired. Mm. I'm just, I'm just so tired. I just want to, I just want to sleep forever. Like that was that, that was sort of the thought. I don't want to do this anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, that was, yeah, that was the moment before. And then I took a bottle of pills and wrote a letter, which I still have. It looks like, looked mm -hmm. like I was 27, but it looks like it was written by a little kid because of course the pills were starting to take effect. So my writing's all wonky. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a Thursday night around 11 PM. And I wasn't found until Saturday around noon. So it's actually kind of miraculous that yeah. I was still breathing. Yeah. yeah. You saved the note. I did. Mm. Uh, did you also say when you were in the hospital that you had a scar on your wrist? Did you also cut? Yeah. So when he woke me up, I had no awareness of the passage of time. It was him that finally came and it was him that shook me awake. This was your, your partner at the time? The partner, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was enraged. I staggered out of my bedroom and I remember it so vividly because I remember trying to walk and I was like Gumby, like my legs felt like jello. So I was walking like my knees were knocking together and I felt like I could hardly hold myself up. I, I shouldn't laugh, but it kind of makes me giggle. The, vi the visual of it makes me giggle because I was so like, like jelly leg. I was so angry at him for having done this to me, like having left me again. And I don't know if I was angry at him for waking me up. Like I can't really remember it. The memories in my head are foggy. I just remember my body and I remember the anger. And I had this pass through in my kitchen where you could reach through. And I had those Wiltshire knives, you know, the ones that sharpen every time you pull them out of the thing in defiance i was like kind of fuck you for waking me up like fuck you for interrupting this and i gashed my wrist open mm. in one swoosh and i remember that too because that everything slowed down it was like slow motion and i can see the wound still i remember seeing the inside of my wrist and the blood shooting all over the place and then i don't remember i don't remember anything after that until i woke up in the hospital but you found out later, like, so obviously, did he take you? Uh, my sister showed up. Somehow or another, they figured out that something was wrong. I think that my my one sister who lived out of town had been trying to call me on the Friday. Mm -hmm. And by the way that I was talking, the two of them together figured out something was catastrophically wrong. Like, I don't know how they did that. I never really had a conversation with them afterward to know how they put it together. But they figured it out. Oh, I do remember Tom was trying to get me outside to get me in an ambulance, but I was rangy. Like I was just like trying to put a cat in a sack, trying to put me in a truck. But my sister and her husband and an ambulance pulled up mm -hmm. all at the same time. Wow. So, wow. so somehow they arrived to take me to the hospital. And that's when that's when it goes blank. So there's like. Yeah, yeah. The moment with the knife and then blankness and then the moment with the truck and then the the arrival of them but it all feels like a dream. I know it's true, but it feels like a dream. And then it's just blankness until I woke up. And how long were you in the hospital for? Oh, I don't know. Probably just a few out, like however long it takes to get through emergency. Like, I right. mean, who knows in Canada, that could be 12 hours. <laughs> right. It can take a long time. Probably not when someone ODs. Like I imagine it probably it would like, if someone's going in like that, they would have it, that's an urgent care thing. So they would have seen me quickly and pump my stomach and stitched up my wrist. But I, I really don't have any memory of how long I was there. And then the, and then the, the time after like the healing after there's about a week, I think where I was really like foggy at home and, and couldn't really put the pieces together. And, and it meant probably the time it takes for drugs to fully work themselves out of their system and, to come down from the trauma. And I, I remember a day about a week later waking up and sort of going like, Oh my God, that really happened. I really almost died, you know, mm -hmm. but there was that moment of clarity that happened in the hospital. Yeah. And it's, again, it's like a, it's like a frozen moment in time. And then I don't remember anything after it. I remember that catalyst moment and the revelation. And then I don't remember any part of getting released or getting home or who was there or any of that. There's about a week afterward that it's just all foggy and gone. 
And you're 27. So when you get out, has your life changed or are you going to like, how do you get better? I don't know if that's the best way to frame it, but that's kind of, yeah. What changes? Well, so interesting because I'm not sure really much of anything did. Like my mother afterward referred to it as the incident. I don't think anyone talked about it. Like, again, there was no, hey, is there anything we can do and follow up to? Like, I don't remember anything like that happening. Well, my my one sister took me like to the mall. She was trying to cheer me up. So she took me to the mall and we were going to get a facial. And then I freaked out. I had a full panic attack because I'm like, they're going to make me, they're going to make me try to buy all this stuff. Like they're going to try to make me sell, like they're going to sell me all the makeup. They're going to make me want to buy everything. And I don't want to do that. So she's like, okay, okay, okay. It's cool. We can go, you know? And and she steered me back out of the store and said she was sorry. So she must've stayed with me for a couple of days because she did actively try to do that. But, but again, there was no conversation, communication, or any of those types of things that I can Mm -hmm. remember. It was sort of like, let's put a bandaid on this. I do remember, though, that I got a referral to the Clark Institute, which is a major psychiatric hospital here in, in like the psychiatric hospital in, in Toronto, through a friend of my older sister. So they were obviously doing some things to try to help, but I can't really remember the details. She got me this referral to the head of psychiatry. And then I tried to go to this other. Do you ever heard of Landmark Forum? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So not a fan. But anyway, I tried to go to that in order to get well. And then I confessed to them that I had used drugs or I was on antidepressants and you're not supposed to do that while you're in their weekends. And so they made me leave because I had, I think, lied to get in because I wanted to do it to get better. And then when I revealed the truth, they're like, I'm sorry, you can't stay because that's one of their stipulations. Um, So I got (laughs) fired from Landmark. And then I was seeing this psychiatrist who's supposed to be, you know, the best in Canada. And I had said to him, I think I, I told him that I was trying Landmark too. And his response was, I don't think you really know what it is that you want and you should probably, you know, figure that out before you come back and see me again. And I, I'm like, you don't think I know what I want. I just fucking tried to kill myself two weeks ago. Like that might've been a clue that I'm a little bit lost and confused right now, you know? So it was his ego a hundred percent. He was like insulted that I was trying more than one thing at a time. And he basically fired me as his patient. So that was a big fuck you to me, but it was a me fuck you in return. Cause I'm like, I don't want to work with someone like that. It just felt like more of the same bullshit where, where it was like, you brought this on yourself. You're doing this to yourself. This is your own mm. fault. I never, ever felt as though at any point along the way, anyone was doing the thing we, we talked about up front, like listening to what was wrong, listening to what the pain was and where my source of, you know, there was never any dealing with the family trauma, which was an enormous trauma. There was never any dealing with the rape in their defense. I didn't tell them because by that point I didn't trust anyone to tell them. And then there was never an addressing of the fact that I was in this abusive relationship and it resulted in drug addiction. Like Mm -hmm. I recognized that I was an adult and I was making those choices, but there were it was self-medication. It was, it's trying to numb the pain. So there was just, there was just nobody willing to help me figure out how to get out of it. I actually kept dating that guy. I stayed with him for another year. Life pretty much went back to normal. Like he worked on Trans Canada pipeline as a steam fitter. And so he made gobs of money and I was living on the road with him and all these little but fuck nowhere towns in Northern Ontario and, and stuff. So finally one day in September, the following year, so 1998, I was in yet another little motel in Petawawa or Pembroke or somewhere. I realized that like, I always made sure that there was a pool and we had great wine. Like we ate like Kings and Queens, right? We had lots of money. And I realized one day that I was drunk every day by four o'clock in the afternoon. And I couldn't accept that in addition to drug addiction, I'm like, I can't be a drunk too. Mm. And so for whatever reason, that was the thing that triggered me into action. Like I just couldn't stomach the thought of it. I was in this hotel room and there was like ashtrays with cigarette butts overflowing and, you know, hotel pictures with streaked with residual cocaine and empty beer bottles and wine bottles in the whole day after scene. And I thought, to myself, if I don't get out of here right now, I'm never getting out of here. I'm going to die like this. So I called my friend, two friends. I called one friend in in Chicago and (laughs) he's American. He's a New Yorker. 
<laughs> so he's got that New Yorker kind of, you know, he's like, sweetheart, he's already done with you. Yeah, yeah. He's like, pack your bags and get out. Like, he's done with you, you know, like, what are you waiting for sort of thing. And so that was a little bit of a kick in the ass in just the right way. Like, it was like two sentences that were enough to sort of validate what I already knew. And then the second person I called was my friend, Kate. And she said, if all you need to get away from that asshole is a place to go, you can come and live with me. Okay. And so I cleaned up the whole hotel room and I packed all my bags. And by the time he got home that afternoon, I, I was ready. And I just said, like, take me home. I'm, I'm done. That was it. That was the moment that I left. And that was the beginning of getting well. Now, it's interesting to answer your question. This, I've looked back on that many, many times and thought to myself, I don't know what it was. I don't know what is that thing that's inside that, that you suddenly go, I got to go, you know, yeah. like, like right now. And I, and I've thought many times of how that's a form of strength and it's something that's in me. And I've thought about the people that maybe can't, don't have it or can't access it. And that, and mm -hmm. like, because it really takes that something reaching way inside and being like, this is the hardest fucking thing I'll ever do, mm -hmm. but I've got to get up and get out of here right now, or I have no choice. And so yeah. it was in there and I compelled myself out of that place. And then this friend that I moved in with, she was a vegan and I was decidedly not <laughs> at the time. <laughs> And she also had all kinds of books on yoga. So here I am, you know, I slept on her couch for the first two weeks. And then she wrote me a letter and said, I love you. I will do anything to support you emotionally, but I can't support you financially. So get your fucking ass off my couch and go get a job. And I still have that letter too, because it effectively was the, like the moment, right. Where I actually got up, but I started eating her food. I couldn't bring meat and things like that into her house. So I started eating her food. And then I started looking through her yoga books and because I was eating and because I was better and doing these things, I started to feel better. And that was really the beginning of being like, oh, wait a sec, like there's more to this than I ever noticed before. I hadn't thought of these things before. And then a few years later, I discovered Gestalt psychotherapy. I started working at a yoga center. I got my yoga teacher training. So I trained at the Gestalt Institute of Toronto and Gestalt therapy and yoga and nutrition were the three things, the three major pieces that, that saved my life, that actually allowed me to go from that place of like the edge of death to what I now to be consider to be thriving. Those were the tools that I didn't have in the kit prior. So, you know, a support system and a different kind of language and a different way of perceiving the world and then a way to literally nurture myself with nutrition and that helped combat all the negative effects of the drugs and alcohol and cigarettes. So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's just like a certain kind of strength and struggle that we, I think we often overlook or, or just bypass, you know, because well, at least what I hear, you know, how, so, so great that you got that job or that promotion or you finished that race. And it, we don't really talk about the struggle to stay alive. No. And how, how much easier it would be to just stay in the hotel room and drink. I mean, come yeah. On. It's not an easy thing to do. And I mean, I just am amazed by the people I talk to who just don't die, frankly. Well, yeah, I had a friend. So I, I worked at the Gestalt Institute for four years. So I had the fortune of meeting hundreds of students that went through the doors and multiple people that I met had a real significant impact on me. And one of them, a guy named Paul, talked about how, you know, he also had been an addict. He also had gone through rehab and and he also found himself at the institute you know wanting to get well and he said you know I've tried all the other things and he said and every one of them felt like a band-aid gestalt ain't no band-aid like it gets right to the meat of what's going on but the beautiful thing about that is it allows you to address your issues at source so then you're mm -hmm. actually healing as opposed to just talking endlessly and repeating yourself in loops so there was that but there was this other guy Bob who came and he was um one of the first um, people, you know, way back in the 80s to have been diagnosed with AIDS. He refers to himself and his group of friends as the dinosaurs. They were the ones that weren't supposed to survive, the ones that the medical community really didn't know what to do with. They tried all the drugs on them and then they ended up running out of solutions. And yet here they were still alive. But I will never forget him saying to me, you know, Lara, I came to the Gestalt Institute to learn how to die. I learned how to live instead. Mm. Dying is easy. Living is the hard part. And it really stuck with me. And I was like, you're right. You know, that's what takes courage. Yeah. I wonder how many people agree with that. 
Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure that's a pacifying thought for someone <laughs> considering suicide because it's like, you're right. That's why I don't want to do it anymore, you know, but it's like, yeah. but. Well, I mean, for me, it's like, I don't give a shit because how many of those people are there for me? Right. I don't agree. Like you weren't, you weren't around. Right, right. Matter. It won't matter either way. You don't have my back. So, you know, like, right. How many people in the world know that you try to end your life? Well, a lot more now that I wrote it in my book, but, but, um, in the immediate time frame, very few knew. Yeah. There was very, there were very few. There was my family, maybe a couple of friends. Of course, like I said, so much. So it was masked as something else at work. And mm -hmm. I didn't really bring it up with people. Yeah, I would say a handful. Now it's much greater than that now, but it wasn't at the time. Well, now, yeah, when you're on this podcast, you wrote a book, you mentioned Clubhouse. It sounds like you're really open about it. Mm -hmm. It sounds like originally going back to the 90s, like that there weren't a lot of people in your life that sort of engaged with you in a way that you found helpful or useful. No. You know, Correct. sort of what we were getting back to it, listening or not listening and all the other Correct. shit. Have you, have you found people that are a little bit better at that for you? Oh my God. Yes. Because I mean, I don't know if you know what Gestalt therapy is, but I don't know much about Gestalt. It's, um, it's a, it's a method, uh, it's a therapeutic method. It's actually a com combination of a bunch of different, um, yeah. philosophies and methodologies, but it was developed by this guy named Fritz Perls, another German. I don't know why Germans crank out so many brilliant people. <laughs> Like, they don't fuck, they're not fucking around. Are they? Exactly. they work their asses off. Something happens in the water. Yeah. And so he had worked with Freud and he felt like he reached this point at which he felt like Freud's Freud's philosophies and Freud's understanding of things were limited. It was like it took it. It took it to a certain point, but it's like not all the way, not far enough. And so Fritz's approach was dealing with the whole individual. So the word gestalt means the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. You know, like you're basically the sum total of everything that has ever happened to you. Mm -hmm. And these incidents in our past create certain behavior patterns that we then carry into adulthood. At the time that we established them, they were life saving, essential responses, mm -hmm. but then they become neurotic patterns. And we mm -hmm. often don't recognize that we've continued to utilize them despite them being neurotic patterns. And so Gestalt psychotherapy uses um, two chair work, hot seat work, sensory work. It's influenced by Zen Buddhism. There's uh, one of the main contributors was a, a study theater. So there's a lot of um, role play and theatrical um, work that's involved in it. But it's, it's very much not sitting and talking about the events of the past over and over and over again, which is very typical of a, of a, of a normal clinical psychiatric setting. We talk about the thing, you know, talk ad nauseum. What Gestalt does is it addresses the, the neurotic behavior pattern in the present where it's getting in the way now. And it, it'll do all different types of experiments in order to sort of flood that behavior, to over-exaggerate that behavior so that you create an awareness of the fact that you're doing it, which then leads to choice. So if I know that I'm doing this thing that was previously unconscious, and then I can catch myself the next time and be like, oh, I'm doing that thing again. Yeah, and I yeah, now yeah, know yeah. that it doesn't work. And so it allows you to break those patterns and um, effectively gives you a toolkit for what to do instead nice. uh, when you're in those situations. And so, yeah, I mean, that community became my world in a lot of, for a little while, it became like a, a family. I've maintained friendships with the people from that class. So the people who went through the program with me speak that same language and mm -hmm. you can address conflict directly without it creating, you know, some catastrophic blow up or whatever. It's like, it's just a moment. Each and everything is just a moment when something is happening. It doesn't translate into a story of forever and ever and ever. Yeah. Um, and yeah. so I, definitely found a massive support system within my Gestalt community, an entirely new toolkit. And it, it infuses sort of everything that I do. It informs my whole way of being in the world, probably the best money and time I ever spent. And then of course, yoga gave it to me in a different way. So, so yoga was kind of the, like for me, yoga is very esoteric and it's 5,000 years of philosophy rammed into, you know, a confined space when you're doing a teacher training program, but the two of them in combination, like Gestalt sort of took those esoteric concepts and turned it into practical everyday application in real life. 
but it also allowed me better access to the esoteric thoughts. Be, you know, the, I found that the two worked really well together. And then just the physical practice of yoga. Uh, of mm-hmm. course, I suffer from PTSD. So anything that is somatic and physically helping um, balance out the two different hemispheres of my brain, which yoga does, is helping to um, minimize the symptoms of PTSD. And then nutrition, I think, honestly, highly underrated number yeah. one keystone to absolutely everything i mean it's it's and our sleep yeah huge and nutrition and sleep is yeah we talk about it but not like how big yeah yeah oh I, so so your question sorry i went on a tangent yes i did find i did find those people who listen yeah 100 yeah. percent. now again it's like i've got hundreds of friends but then the the, the group of like the people who really have the skill set for that type of listening is pretty small but i've been lucky that they've you know, been here and stuck with me. So I do have yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm also glad that you, uh, you didn't succeed in that. If that's the right word. I know we're not allowed to use that word, but complete perhaps would be the better word, complete. right? Yeah. Back I know. I was like, did I succeed or not succeed? It's right. just, it depends which way you look at it. I'm like, yes, the word is weird in there, but you know, it's yeah. funny because I, I, again, of course I was reflecting because it was just the, the anniversary the other day. And I thought, mm-hmm. man, I've done a lot of really cool stuff since then. You know, I'm, I'm really glad I didn't either. And one of the questions in the questions that you sent in advance was, you know, would you ever do it again? Mm-hmm. And my answer is a, unequivocal no like I love being alive I really really do and of course there are days that have been hard hor- you know my son has a brain injury I almost lost him to that so I've been through a lot of trauma over the last five decades the last four in particular the first 10 years were okay a lot of trauma in my life a lot of really big heavy things have happened one of which would be enough for the average person yeah. let alone all of them piled on top of one another I, but I've thought about it to give the question air to like to examine for my own sake, would I ever go there? And it's just an hard no. It's an absolute no. Like I really love being alive. Mm. I'm really glad I stuck. I stayed. So yeah, thanks. I'm glad to. (laughs) And I'm glad that you are cool with being open. I know for sure people hear it, you know, and sometimes they'll reach out to me. And if the person who wants, who's the guest, they'll put their information and sometimes they'll reach out to them through this. And I'm glad that they're able to find others who kind of get it or you know how it is, right? There's just not a lot of people who are like, oh, I kind of get that. All right, let's talk. Yeah. I mean, I think the the number one thing for me when I'm when I'm speaking with people who are still in that state, I mean, I'm getting to be a bit remo- more removed from it now, the longer the, the time goes by. But I do still remember so vividly that darkness and the and the all consuming feeling of that darkness and, you know, the, the monster over my shoulder sort of thing. And it's not so distant that I can't still feel its breath (laughs) every once in a while. Like I don't go to those depths anymore, but I, I remember the monster. I remember the blackness. I guess the main thing that I really would love to be able to like infuse into everybody's heart and soul and mind is that I know it feels like it's endless right now, but there really is light on the other side of it. Like there's people like me and you who will listen and won't judge the thoughts you're having and, and can show you how to get to the other side. Even if it is Sean, like you said, just by shutting up and letting Mm -hmm. the story be told, it's frustrating to try to go through the system, but there isn't only one way through the dark. Right. You know? Yeah. Also, I'm wondering before we go, are you a regular contributor at that clubhouse room or is that a one-time thing? Uh, well, so we started this thing and um, we had really low uh, attendance. We had a couple of rooms. I mean, it's very brand new. It's just it like takes a, time. It takes a few a weeks old. We sort of the feedback was maybe the word suicide is, is, is too scary. Maybe it's too in your face. And so, so we were trying to figure out, you know, are we going to keep that and just try to keep building on it? Um, next week we were going to p- experiment with them. Um, let's eat our feelings. Like we were going to get a little more tongue in cheek about it, but we're really sort of, yes, it's going to be a biweekly thing. Yeah. Every second Sunday. So it was meant to happen on the fourth. We, we canceled this week. My mom had neurosurgery and a bunch of other stuff happened. Our intention over the next two weeks is to regroup and figure out how we're going to move forward with it. But it is, it is intended to be a regular thing every two weeks, 7 30 PM Eastern time on clubhouse 
and it's under the umbrella of apartment five. So APT new, number five is okay. the name of my club. We were calling it SOS. So survivors of suicide, but now we're sort of working it out and really open also to people's ideas. So if people want to talk about it and they think that they've got an idea for how we can make it work better and the types of topics they want to talk about, then we're all ears. Like we're happy to, to listen to audience suggestions. So and when you say survivors, do you mean both loss and attempt survivors? Yeah. Because those can sometimes be tricky to put together, but I think it's. Yeah. Well, and I think part of the benefit of like mixing the two is that someone contemplating it can hear from someone who has lost someone and understand the impact that it has you and, go. and, you know, vice versa, right. Yeah. Un- someone who has lost someone can listen to someone who is suicidal and understand better, yeah. maybe what happened, like why someone would come to that decision. So our ideal was to mix people together and really just allow people to come and share their stories and for us to listen and for others to listen. And then if they want input or information, we can give it. Okay. Thank you so much again for talking. And we'll, and I'm happy to do part two. Let's see how this one works out. Yeah, that'd be great. Awesome, Lara. Thanks again. And I'll... Uh, Thanks, I'll Jeff. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much for listening and all of your support and special thanks to Lara up in Ontario, Canada. Thank you, Lara. If you are a suicide attempt survivor and you'd like to share your story, I'd love to talk. Please reach out. Hello at SuicideNoted.com or on Facebook or Twitter at Suicide Noted. That is all for episode number 68. Stay strong. Do the very best you can. I'll talk to you soon.